Hello and welcome to the first video chat in our new SCM Now Impact Live series. My name is Beth Rennie, I'm Editor-in-Chief at ASCM and I am here with our CEO, Abe Eshkenazi. Good afternoon, Beth. Hey, so if you're watching this but you don't get an email from Abe each Friday, I'd like to quickly point out that you can subscribe for free at ASCM.org slash impact. But for those of you who are regular readers, uh, you'll remember that this past week's topic was recession, something that's definitely on people's minds these days. Um, but what you might not know is that Abe's weekly blog was actually a direct product of the Great Recession. Uh, we started doing these back in 2008. We wanted to highlight supply chain professionals' essential role in the global marketplace. Um, particularly because ASCM members can make such a big difference in the success of economies, especially at challenging times. Uh, so Abe, I'd like to start off by having you talk a little bit more about that. Yep, yeah, thanks Beth. Uh, it really was an interesting exercise for us uh, in trying to understand what the members were going through, specifically what supply chain professionals, the men and the women, uh, what their life was like during the recession. In almost every uh, paper, whether it was financial or otherwise, there was discussions about inventory reduction and core processes and being close to your customer and your vendors. This was all supply chain activities. So we brought in a number of supply chain professionals and we asked them if they saw themselves in the news and how did they react to the news about supply chain being out there because at the time, back in 2008, you know, 2009, supply chain wasn't as well understood even as it is today. Just in the past three to four weeks, we've seen, we've gotten a huge education about supply chain. But back in 2008, 2009, this was still predominantly a back office function. The men and the women uh, often uh, were relegated to planning uh, behind the scenes, not traditionally at the C-suite or in a uh, forward position for the organization. More often than not, their time to get called was when there was a problem, either in a delivery or in production or in raw materials. So they often didn't get the opportunity to you know, have a discussion about risk and mitigation and resiliency and responsiveness. So we wanted to bring them in and to see from their perspective, what were they reading in the newspapers? What were they seeing about supply chain? And it was interesting because the first uh, cohort that we brought in, they, uh, they didn't see themselves at all in the news. Even though in the Wall Street Journal is all about inventory reductions and you know, being you know, the core about your business functions. And so uh, as we you know, do with any survey, when you get a wrong result, you think that the survey uh, participants are wrong. So we brought in a second cohort and we asked them the same question and we got the same response. And so we started doing interviews about what is it that they were missing? Why didn't they connect with the issues that were in the news every day? And it was really enlightening that uh, the major reason was that these individuals had a head down focus and that they were concerned predominantly about doing their job and doing it well, but not connecting it to the overall impact that the recession was having, not only on their company, but the economy as a whole. And so one of the things that we wanted to do was connect our members to the news every day. So if you look at the construct of the article for the readers, they'll see that we bring in a topic that is often maybe tangentially related to supply chain, but we find a way that it directly impacts the role and responsibility of supply chain professionals. So what we wanted to do, and what we've done over the years, is attempted to connect supply chain a much broader imperative on not only the you know the financial aspect of the you know the supply chain but the people the impact of supply chain having on consumers having on patients and as we sit here today I think we can uh, clearly see that there's a much better understanding and appreciation for the benefits and also the challenges supply chain has sure. Now, in your blog post this past Friday, as I mentioned before, you discussed uh, numerous real-world strategies that companies used in the past to navigate a recession. So what do you personally think are some of the most important tactics that ASCM members, supply chain professionals, should be considering and working toward right now in order to do the same? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question because I think there's some um, 
activities that should be carried on irrespective of recession or positive times. And, uh, and there are some activities that you need to take in the short term and then prepare for the long term. So let's talk first about those activities that organizations ought to have as part of their strategy uh, every day. And uh, we'll start first with employees. Uh, first, safety and health of the employees. If uh, your workers are not protected and if they don't feel that they're in a safe environment, you're not going to be able to address the consumer or the patient needs. So first and foremost, the safety of your employees. Second is training. Uh, we believe that training should not be a binary switch, that it only is turned on when uh, either the economy or the economics for the organization are going well and to be pulled back when there is a recession. Uh, too often we've seen organizations pull back on training and or membership for organizations, whether in a professional sense or in a uh, organizational sense. And that's kind of counterintuitive. If we ask any organization, what's your number one asset? I think most of them would indicate that it's staff, it's people. So if you use a asset rationalization or if you evaluate your, you know, your products and services and your core assets for the organization and you identify your core asset or your number one asset is your people, you should invest more in your people during the, you know, the difficult times, not less. It only serves the organization to have qualified, competent, and capable employees, not only to address the situation today, but to aid in the recovery, and more importantly, in the risk mitigation and the responsiveness that you need in the future. So that's first. Secondly, stay close to your customers and stay close to your vendors. You have to understand what their challenges are and find ways that you can work together. This disruption will end and you will end up in a collaborative opportunity with your vendors and with your customers. Now is the time to demonstrate that commitment to being a collaborative partner for your vendors and also for your customers. Oftentimes, if you are in a better financial situation, you may be giving discounts and or delays in payment to help them get through this difficult time. More importantly, you need to plan accordingly, and that requires staff who are competent and capable to understand what real demand is right now that's coming through the system versus some of the false signals that we're getting about uh, what role responsibilities and what manufacturing and supply chain can help individuals, uh, more importantly, uh, consumers and patients. Each of the verticals that we talk about go through different, obviously, uh, challenges. Uh, if we talk about food and if we talk about consumer packaged goods, we're seeing a spike in those industries, but yet we're not seeing an increase in utilization. It's only a shift moving the product from one um, traditional source, whether it be a restaurant or a uh, commercial or industrial venue, into a home-based environment. These are shifts in the supply. Then we can take a look at temporary, um, also spikes in terms of the toilet paper and the paper towels. That's not an, a real demand increase. That's just a, you know, a temporary spike. In order to understand and be able to forecast appropriately so your organization does not get uh, the, the term whipsawed or bullwhipped into responding to incorrect or inaccurate data points, you need to have competent individuals that can discern what is real demand versus what is a short-term spike in demand and what is a shift in uh, a real change in demand that organizations need to respond to. It's, uh, it's clear that we're going to uh, be uh, dealing with this over the next six, nine, 12 to 18 months. If you take a look at the logistics industry, uh, there are planes, uh, ships, trucks that are all over the world and they're not in the places that they need to be. It's going to take time to realign the supply chain so whether you're talking about food or whether you're talking about pharma, it's going to take time for the supply chain to respond. So uh, there are a number of activities that you can take, but again, it is dependent on the industry and the impact that it has on those industries. Yep. Uh, so obviously we've been talking a lot about risk management in the last few months. Um, one of the things that you pointed out in your blog is that the risk that we're facing now is unique for businesses and supply chains because 
we're talking about the risks of a global health crisis yeah. at the same time as the risk of a financial crisis, a recession. Yes. So it, it's unique and recovery is going to most likely hinge on widely available testing yes. so that people can get back to work and the economy can ramp up again. Um, so what do you think are some key measures that both businesses and governments should be considering to achieve that? Uh, you hit the first one and that is safety and people feeling comfortable that they can go out of their houses and either go to their work, go to school, go to uh, theaters, go to concerts, go to a uh, venue where there are going to be other individuals. So we need to ensure that testing is sufficient to uh, allay the fears of an individual uh, venturing out of their homes and into an unsafe environment. So that's a critical aspect of this. We also need to have collaboration and visibility within the supply chains. Uh, right now, we're uh, dealing with a number of changes of uh, domestic versus uh, global resource allocation, and we're seeing a tremendous need for uh, more agility and responsiveness to pandemics. This has not, uh, as you indicated, it was not a financial crisis. Prior to the disruption here, we were almost working at full capacity. Uh, employment was at historic lows. Uh, if you uh, wanted a job, there was very little barriers to uh, getting a job uh, back in the day, uh, even uh, two to three months ago, why don't we say back in the day today. Um, so, Good old days. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's changed dramatically. So now we're dealing with a significant disruption of people, and they need to be retrained, and they need to see that there are opportunities. So where we see a reduction in uh, workforce in either the food or the restaurant or the retail industries, there are opportunities in warehousing and logistics and um, other opportunities for individuals to get back into an employment setting, again, assuming that it's safe. But a absolutely, this is a, um, a temporary and a significant hit to the economic side, but the humanitarian side is where we really need to pay attention. We're not running out of toilet paper. We're not running out of consumer packaged goods. Uh, those will be and are coming back to um, the stores. Uh, again, the, the psychology of rationing and hoarding, I'm not going to get into that. That would be another association that can respond to it. But you'll see that the supply chains are catching up, that there are inventories. Now, you may not see it at the end of the day, but at the beginning of the day, the shelves are being restocked. So we need to ensure that people understand that the supply chain will recover. It will respond, but it does take time for it to respond. And each recovery is going to be at a different pace. It's not going to be a, um, a switch on the wall that we turn on the economy and everything is going to go back to uh, what was a, uh, perceived as normal back then. Uh, I think we're challenged right now in terms of what the recovery looks like and how long we're going to see before it's a full recovery. Uh, we talked about some of the industries that were impacted. Uh, take a look at travel. Well, we don't anticipate travel to come back right away, so that's going to impact conferences, it's going to impact venues that rely on individuals being able to move freely from one location to another. So the, as this goes through, the, um, the evaluation on what is um, more permanent changes versus temporary changes that we're responding to, we're going to see the supply chain is responding to it. We will be a better economy. We will be much more uh, assured of what we need to do the next time around. Unfortunately, this hit us when we were probably least prepared to deal with a pandemic issue. This was not a financial crisis. This was much more on the humanitarian side that is leading to a financial crisis. So the fundamentals for business were all appropriate. There was nothing that was you know, um, a, um, a warning signal within the economic market. It was, it's much more on the humanitarian side. But as organizations develop risk mitigation, as they learn on how to respond to this, we're going to be better as an economy, we're going to be better as a, you know, as a people to respond to this. But uh, the unfortunate part is that um, this is going to have to take a quite a bit of time because of the severity of the issue and the impact that it's had to get people comfortable, not only with 
um, going out again, but more importantly, feeling like they can go into a work setting or into a, um, any other venue and know that they are safe and protected. All right. Okay, for our final question, um, A, what are some resources that ASCM offers to our members that can help them start rebalancing their networks and preparing for next steps and ultimately recovery? Yeah, it's a, I think everybody is uh, wanting to get there sooner than later, and I think we do as well. Um, if we identified before the number one asset for organizations as people, then training is the number one response, and that is uh, whether you're an individual and you have some time on your hands, there are a number of free resources that organizations are providing. Uh, we have one as well uh, for the principles on demand. But this may be a time to take a look at your, you know, your capabilities and your competencies, and maybe it's an opportunity for you to upskill and to see that there are different opportunities for you to get uh, trained and or competent in other areas. The company needs to focus on their employees as well. It's not just the individuals, it's organizations committing to their employees. So they need to ensure that uh, they're doing everything that they can to save their employee base because you don't uh, easily replace uh, qualified, and competent individuals. It takes time. The um, next thing is that the organizations can do is focus on teams. Uh, collaboration is going to be a highly sought after um, sort of tactic for organizations because you're bringing together uh, sales, you're bringing together operations, you're bringing together support, you're bringing together finance. All these teams within your organization need to align on how to respond accordingly and what steps each one of them can take. So collaboration is going to be a significant part of our uh, recovery opportunity. Next you need to develop risk mitigation strategies, uh, not only in terms of dealing in the short term, but what would this mean for the next six to nine months if your industry or if your company is not going to recover as quickly as some of the others. So you need to pay attention, obviously, to the financials. You need to pay attention to your vendors and your customers and how long this could take. Obviously, with the CARES Act, there are opportunities for organizations to buffet their, uh, their reduction in revenue or their expenses that they've had to maintain. So those are uh, some resources. Finally, um, stay close to uh, other professionals. Uh, there are webinars, there are chat rooms, there are a host of resources that if you just uh, take the first step in searching out those resources, they're there. But you've got to do a little bit of digging to find out where they are. There's a lot of noise in the marketplace right now. Um, I would say go to those trusted resources that have been doing it in the past and make sure that they're consistent in terms of what they're doing in the future. They will be there uh, not only today, but they'll be there in um, a year, two years, five years from now. Um, lastly, uh, this is the time associations need to step up. Uh, this is the reason associations uh, exist, is to provide fact-based information, to be relevant and to be timely with information. I can think of no better time than to reach out to your association, whether you're at ASCM or any or other professional organizations, reach out to them. This is their opportunity to demonstrate value and benefit to you as an individual and as a company. All right. Thank you so much, Abe. And thanks to everyone who is checking out our very first Tuesday video chat. Uh, to hear more from ASCM CEO Abe Ashkenazi every Tuesday, be sure to follow ASCM on our LinkedIn and YouTube channels. Thanks, Beth. Thanks. All the best.